Thank, thank you, Liam. Um, I, I recognize a few friendly faces that are known here, which always surprises me that people would come back to hear me talk again. Um, and then the rest of you, of course, you don't know, you're in for a little bit of heresy about the, the helicopter world. If it were a religion, I'd be burning at a stake somewhere. So um, we're going to talk about a couple of seemingly separate items here. Uh, one is my particular presentation. Uh, the second one is what I've adapted from what Peter Ireland would have talked about. Peter can't be here, unfortunately. So I will make a disclaimer, which you're never supposed to do, that right at the beginning, I don't know Peter's subject that well. But that's not a problem because it's a very complex subject that's going to require a lot of, in, a, a lot of time to get introduced and understood around the, the, the bazaars, as you will see when we get into it. It's a very interesting concept that will go beyond any of the safety stuff that's out there right now. Uh, just a little bit about uh, Marinvent Corporation. We're a, basically a research and development company in uh, St. Bruno, just south of Montreal. We do a lot of avionics research. Uh, we have a lot of certification experience. Uh, I used to work for Transport Canada as a flight test pilot, and I'm now a flight analyst for helicopters. The boss is a uh, fixed-wing test pilot, and so We've got a lot of information about certification and the certification process. The first part of what I'm going to talk about is where there is a failure in the whole continuum of aviation safety uh, that is only really sort of crystallized in my mind in the last uh, uh, six months or so. Peter's background is a fixed-wing uh, pilot. Flew, he uh, flew for. Uh, Korean Airlines and Qantas before that. He uh, flew for the Australian Air Force and the New Zealand Air Force before that. So sort of like me, no fixed address, wanted by several constabularies. Um, and he, his uh, concept is, uh, is, hopefully you'll see, fairly well, that's the word I'm looking for here, is fairly well developed within the academic world, but hasn't hit the, the mainstream safety world. So. With that, off we go. All right. The technology is letting me down. It worked a few minutes ago. Pardon me. Well, it's uh, resetting. I'll start talking about it. Safety is, in aviation is a continuum, OK? Where does it start? Any ideas? Where does the safety in aviation start? Right. No, nope, long before that. From design. From design, yes, exactly. You have to have a good design. And um, the design has to meet some requirements, OK? Anybody know where those requirements exist? Bet you didn't know this was going to be a test. The design requirements for helicopters exist in part 25, 27 for normal helicopters up to 7,000, or if you're the Bell 429, 7,500 pounds. And um, for part 29, for transport category helicopters, Um, a bunch of other stuff has to be shut down here in a minute. I don't, having a little grief, been a Mac guy for years, and this is the first time it's letting me down. So, um, anyways, so the certification requirements exist in Part 29. Has anyone ever read Part 29? Anyone ever seen it? Know where it lives? Know where it exists? Two people. Um, how long did it? How long did uh, you last trying to read through it? Five, ten, yeah, five, ten minutes. Okay, I started uh, at uh, transport with 15 years' experience in flight testing, and it took me two years. Here we go. It took me two years to start to understand certification. So if you don't have any knowledge of it. 
I'm not surprised. Anyway, it starts with a good design. The design has to meet the certification requirements. Um, oh, come on. This is most embarrassing. Sorry, yeah, I know it can't crash. It's I have to say, in all the time I've been doing this, I've never had this happen. But you would... Right. Ah, here we go. Go back to the fallback stuff, the stuff that works, predictability. Um, anyways, <coughs> it's, it's not a question of certifying a design. If someone comes up to you and says, here's my airplane, certify it, you can't do that. You have to have a design that can be certified. We'll talk more about that later. So we obtain a type certificate. Um, there are two paragraphs that are very important in all of this, uh, that are very related. Paragraph 1301 and paragraph 1309. 1301 says, and this is one of these, oh, come on, why did you need to say this? If you get right down to the bottom one, each item of installed equipment must function properly when installed. Well, what the hell else did you expect it to do? Right? Well. That's complicated enough because what's underlying that means in all conditions. All conditions of failures, uh, all the rest of it, unless that piece of equipment has failed, it's got to function properly all the time. All the temperature ranges, altitudes, all of that sort of stuff. 1301's um, sort of a catch-all. Whoever wrote that's pretty smart to do that way back when these things first came out. 1309, a little more complicated. Um, we're not going to go into all of this. I can tell you with some certainty, you can make a career out of this paragraph in the certification basis, okay? The equipment systems installation is required, must be designed and installed to ensure they perform intended function under any foreseeable operating condition. Well, that's what 1301 says, right? Um, must be designed, and I've taken out a lot of the stuff that's irrelevant here, for category Air A aircraft, the occurrence of any failure condition which would prevent the continued safe flight and landing of the rotorcraft is extremely improbable. Well, it doesn't state that in the, the design, these requirements, but the words extremely improbable have some very definite and tight definitions about what that means, how frequently that can occur. And compliance must be shown by analysis, and where necessary, et cetera, et cetera, must include possible failure mode, modes of failure, including malfunctions, et cetera, et cetera. So you get one little paragraph in the uh, FARs, or the Canadian uh, CARs, because we use the same things, um, that have all of this. So what? What do you do with that? So that one little paragraph has some complications that are just starting. The next part is there's an advisory circular. Now the advisory circular is written for airliners, fixed wing airliners, but because it covers everything, everybody uses it. So the advisory circular is 25.1309 with some revision letters after it. 
Uh, and that, in turn, indirectly, or maybe directly, refers to a document from the Society of Automotive Engineers. I mean, who knew? Anybody here ever know that the Society of Automotive Engineers had anything to do with airplanes? Sorry? I guess. They've got large cockpit working groups, large aircraft cockpit working groups. They've got all sorts of stuff. So they have a thing called an aerospace random recommended practice, 4761, that's 170 pages long. So one paragraph in the requirements goes to a 19-page advisory circular that says you'd better go to this document to try and work out the certification basis. And there's a whole host of things in here. As you can see, these are all pretty much going to give you what can fail. How do you work out what can fail, what the effects are, and so on and so forth. So we have functional hazard assessments, system safety assessments, and this isn't the complete list by the way. I'm not, it, it's absolutely fascinating what's in there. Um, do you think any of these pieces of work are going to win the Nobel Prize for Literature? Not likely. They're very, very boring bits of work, but essential. Okay? So this is how, as you go through the certification of an aircraft, either transport, in this case a transport category helicopter, you have to go through all of this from the manufacturer's point of view and put this all in front of the certification authorities, airworthiness people. Okay? Now, uh, you probably have not had any interface with the certification airworthiness people in, for most people. You're operators. You go out and you operate aircraft and, and you do all of that. But in most of the certification authorities, there's an airworthiness section that does the initial certification of aircraft. They have flight test engineers, they have pot test pilots, they have uh, avionics people, they have systems people, they have cabin safety people. Okay, all sorts of different specialists who go in to say this is what you need to certify an aircraft and we make sure that you meet all the requirements. This, by the way, is a typical fault tree. It's an eye test, particularly for those in the front of the room. You should be able to read all of that. Um, but that goes through and says, here's all of the things that can fail, that all of these things must combine as you work your way up to say, here's what the failure is, and here's what we expect the pilots to do, or here's the way we mitigate this failure is not ever going to have an effect because we have a redundant system or whatever. It's complicated, very boring reading. It uh, takes lots and lots of detailed knowledge of the systems to look through it. And you need to know the interrelationship between the systems, okay? So the hydraulics guys will do a, a failure, uh, one of the failure uh, analysis, and they'll come up and say, here it is. And the electrical people will do one and say, here it is. But guess what? Not many people look at the, the interrelationship between the hydraulics and the electrics. So that if an electrical system fails and takes out a particular sensor or switch that the hydraulic system relies on, there's maybe a good chance that gets missed in the whole certification process. That's why you need specialist people who know and spend a lot of time doing this. This is one of the big reasons why it takes so long to certify an aircraft. Okay. As you go through the process, someone will, I mean, you can't do this until you've defined the system, can you? Until you've laid out the electrical system and what it's going to do, there's not much point in working on the failure effects analysis. Now, part of the requirements are going to tell you what you have to put into your electrical system in order to make it meet all of those failure effects analysis, but um, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. So what? Well, two recent examples, we're still not getting this right. Okay? Boeing's just announced that they've got some 
system where the battery will never blow up. They've, they've fixed the problem. You've got to ask the question, why didn't that get solved before the aircraft got into production? So Air France 447, um, no one seemed to be paying attention to the possibility of uh, pitot probes completely icing up. Uh, or the fact that the system, the autopilot system, when it sensed the airspeed was below 80 knots, said, we must be on the ground. We couldn't be flying with airspeed less than 80 knots, so therefore we must be on the ground and would disable the stall warning system. So there's a bunch of stuff like that that you can see, and we see it regularly in hindsight, that it's, we're not perfect at this yet. The problem is the assumptions used in this certification are only known and used in the initial certification. Okay? So the people who really know it, the manufacturers people, are all design engineers and, and certification people, and at the Airworthiness Authority are all the Airworthiness certification people. Okay? And we'll come back to this in a minute. So more of this continuum of safety. So we get the type, type of aircraft produced. Uh, it enters service. We have a thing called the type certificate data sheet. Any of you ever seen a type certificate data sheet? Where do they live? Websites, yep. You can go to the FAA website, Transport Canada website, and pick up the, trend, the type certificate data sheet for any of the aircraft registered in that country. Very interesting. Um, what does the certificate of airworthiness say about the type certificate data sheet? I would have thought you'd all have it memorized. It says something to the effect that when maintained and operated in accordance with the limitations on the type certificate data sheet, the aircraft is airworthy. So what happens when you overload your aircraft? exceed the maximum weight of the aircraft. Your certificate of airworthiness is no longer valid. And I think that for most of you that means your insurance is no longer valid, doesn't it? Not very well known. A lot of people say certific certificate of airworthiness is just a maintenance thing. No, it's not. It actually has to do with that, the limitations in the type certificate data sheet. So, Pay attention to that. So it enters service. We'll assume it's operated within limitations and it's maintained in accordance with the maintenance instructions and it gets and maintains a certificate of airworthiness. Are the airplanes we, uh, we produce and operate perfect? I mean, need no maintenance, right? Hardly. So we find defects, okay? And we may modify the type design, with either with an STC or going back to the manufacturer, and they come up with an airworthiness directive that says, you better fix this, here's a problem, okay? And with that, airworthiness is assured. Or is it? We hope it is. We have service difficulties. We get in-service difficulties. Depending on the country and the operation, you'll write up a service difficulty report. Certainly all the people in Canada do in commercial operations, am I right? Not everyone in the United States in commercial operations has to write up service difficulty reports. So them being the major operators of aircraft, we have a problem. Not everything that's gone wrong gets reported, okay? And not all countries are in the service difficulty reporting system. Anybody know which countries are involved in, in, for the Canadian type of system? Anybody know? Canada, obviously. United States. UK and Australia, I believe, are the only ones that are directly involved in this, okay? So, hmm, if you're a, uh, Aircraft manufacturer in, uh, we'll use Dilbert's, Elbonia, uh, and you're a part of the service difficulty reports, how do you know what's going wrong with your aircraft? Stick right. A 
tech rep. Does everybody have a tech rep? No. Small operators won't. So we, we've got a real problem trying to gather the data on what's going on with the aircraft. So a fair statement is not all the problems will be found or noted, particularly by some manufacturers who live outside of Canada, the United States, England, and Australia. For example, in the US in Part 91 operations, if you have an engine failure and you land your aircraft safely without any damage to uh, the aircraft or injuries, you don't need to report the engine failures. I remember telling this to a very senior FAA man one day, and he said, oh, no, 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 they're all reported. And the man standing next to him, also FAA, coughed quietly and said, <coughs> no, sir, they're not all reported. So we have a great deal of lack of knowledge about what's really going on, even within some of the authorities, about, about all of this. So we're coming to the hidden flaw with the system. We have a certification airworthiness authority that may know all the assumptions made to uh, meet the airworthiness requirements of paragraph 1309. I say may because sometimes there's assumptions made that don't get uh, passed on to the authority. Should know the failures and the causes and the effects. However, once an aircraft enters service, problems with that aircraft switch over to a different section, the continuing airworthiness section. In most authorities, it's separate from the initial certification people, and they don't know the assumptions used in certification. In fact, in most authorities, they don't know the process of how an aircraft gets certified. That's not part of their training. They're there to take care of maintenance issues, and as far as their bosses are concerned, that's what they, all they really need to know. So they have no way of knowing the seriousness of failures, unless someone points it out to them, okay? So are you starting to see a problem here? So I've got two examples of this, <clears throat> and believe, the intention of these two examples is not to point fingers of blame at anybody, okay? I've just found out some information about the uh, S-92 that might have modified what I had to say, but that's, that's not going to change the big picture of what I'm going to show you here. Um, so the Bell 212, are any of you familiar with this accident? Bell 212, total electrical failure in the Seychelles. It was a positioning flight. The aircraft had been flown in on another airplane, put together, had done a, uh, a check flight. They were, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, I think. So, wow, fly at 3 in the morning. They were going to reposition the helicopter to start doing tourist flights. Um, it was, there was a thunderstorm nearby, and several minutes after takeoff, the aircraft crashed into the water and seven, seven people died, I think, something like that. Fair number of people. Very strange symptoms here. No caution or warning lights were lit in the aircraft. If you've been around aircraft accidents, you know that they can tell if a caution light's lit because it's melted into the plastic, uh, whatever. None of them were lit. Only the eyebrow lights on the aircraft were, uh, were on. They were just on underneath the uh, glare shield. Those were the only lights in the aircraft cockpit that were on. One engine had failed. Now that engine failing should have lit up a bunch of lights. The fact that the rotor RPM was down at 75% should have lit up a bunch of other lights. None of them were lit. Que pasa? So, Bell 212 has two very large electrical DC generators, uh, and the normal load in the aircraft is very low. It's difficult to get the two generators to put out the same amount of electrical power, paralleling the generators, it's called. It's a difficult process. So, people spend a lot of time with adjustment uh, screwdrivers making changes to do all of that. Um, however, when you look through the maintenance uh, requirements, there is no, re no requirement, as with most aircraft, to check that the electrical components in the generator control unit meet their original design specs 
i.e. for resistors, that they have the same resistance and capacitors have the same capacitance as when it was new. Very surprising. It's, it's sort of like circuit breakers. Anybody here aircraft maintenance? Okay. Is there a requirement to make sure that the circuit breakers function properly when you do repeated maintenance on the aircraft? How many of you pulled a, have dropped the circuit breaker panel and noticed corrosion on the circuit breakers? How many of you have tried to pull circuit breakers and they won't pull? So you get the famous radio failed to protect, radio blew up in order to protect the circuit breaker. Okay? Really surprised at that. There's no requirement in the maintenance thing to make sure circuit breakers work properly, even though they're put in there as part of the, the failure effects analysis to make sure that things all work. So here's this generator control unit. It's 25 years old. How, uh, how close to the original design specs do you think the circuit breaker, or sorry, the uh, capacitors and resistors are? Now remember, it's near a thunderstorm, so what's the humidity going to be like? You think that affects those electrical components? Probably. So now here's the kicker. That serial number airframe had had a total electrical failure a year earlier, again near a thunderstorm. They landed safely. No one reported it to the authorities. Bell 212 is a Part 29 helicopter. If you remember back to paragraph 1309, what did it say about failures? In general, when you read that, it says, can't have that kind of failure. Impossible to have a total electrical failure in a transport category helicopter. Just like you can't have both engines fail at the same time, unless you've run out of gas, which that's another story. So, We've had this transport category helicopter suffer a total electrical failure. By the way, they couldn't duplicate it. When they shut the helicopter down, they started it up again, everything worked fine. But no one ever reported it. So uh, Transportation Safety Board's Bill Yearwood, i uh, given him a free uh, uh, gotcha on this one. He did some excellent detective work. I don't know, is that going to get him in trouble? No? Okay, good. Um, did some excellent detective work on this, and basically the scenario he came up with was it was caused by an electromagnetic pulse from a nearby lightning strike. Okay? That electromagnetic pulse hit one of the generator control units, and because the components weren't up to original spec, shut off that generator. That generated a pulse through the electrical system to the other generator control unit, which shut off the second generator. The battery switch is held on as a relay, and so the, the second generator failing shut off the battery relay, which shut off all of the lights, except the eyebrow lights come direct from the battery. They don't go through any of the rest of the circuits. So we have a total electrical failure. That's bad enough over the ocean in the middle of the night, don't you think? How many of you would like to do that? I mean, all your flight instruments, the only instruments that are going to work is the airspeed indicator and the altimeter. The rest of it's all going to die right there. You've got nothing to look at because it's all dark. So what caused the engine to fail? PT-6 engine, reliable. Well. PT-6 engine, in this case, fuel is normally supplied by a pump in the tank to the engine. It goes through an oil-to-fuel heat exchanger. When the fuel's warm, it's supposed to bypass the oil-to-fuel heat exchanger, okay? There's a dormant failure there. If it's not bypassing the oil-to-fuel heat exchanger when it's warm, how do you know that it's not bypassing if the pump in the tank is working? It's just going to push it through that oil-to-fuel heat exchanger. Well, there was a maintenance pro procedure that every 50 hours, the mechanic had to go out just before shutdown and put his hand on one of the pipes to make sure that the, oil, the fuel wasn't going through that pipe or something like that. I mean, that's once every 50 hours. They happened to hit that particular thing. 
The engine-driven pump can't suck warm fuel through that oil-to-fuel heat exchanger. Engine fails. So we've got a whole bunch of things that really, sadly, add up to not very good news for this whole operation. So there's no electrics, there's no pump in the fuel tank working, and the engine-driven pump just can't pump it up and the engine quits. Um, there's no indication of an, of an engine failure because none of the lights are working. The gauges probably aren't working. I'm not sure if the triple tack is a DC gauge or whatever it is, but it's electrical. Okay, so a real problem with this whole thing, the crew really didn't know what was going on. But the moral of the story, no one knew that they should have reported the early total electrical failure. The certification authority for the Bell 212 still doesn't know that this happened. So nothing is going to get done about it. And there's no action to fix the problem. Like I said earlier, I'm really surprised that with all of the history we've got, we've got aircraft flying around now that are really old, with really old electrical components, and there's no requirement for anybody to make sure that the resistors and capacitors meet their original specs. So, S92, uh, the Cougar uh, accident where they lost the transmission oil. Uh, the authorities granted the type certificate on the basis of no oil leak. How did that happen? Well, um, the basis for the transmission design was the Black Hawk H60 transmission. Sikorsky's experience in doing overhauls on those, and there are quite a few of them out there, was that they'd take the transmission out at 2,000 hours or whatever it was, the oil filter had never been off. The oil filter just never needed any attention at all. Nice design, right? Works pretty well. Maintenance people don't have to take the transmission oil filter off. By the way, in the Blackhawk, it's a pain particularly the VIP Blackhawks, because it's, you have to go inside the cabin and you'll get oil on the seats. So it's a good thing you don't have to do that. So they said, well, it's pretty reasonable that we're not going to worry about the oil filter as a possible source of an oil leak in the S92. Uh, so all of this happens. Never a maintenance issue. S92 design, they improved the oil filter, they made some changes. They improved the oil filter from 30 microns or whatever it was to 3 microns. That's got to be a good thing, right? Why isn't it a good thing? Right? Well, I mean, if you, if you design the filter properly, it's not a big deal, is it? The problem is another thing they did. Since the filter never comes off, to save a little weight, they changed the attachment for the oil filter as well. That's okay, isn't it? Well, here comes the problem. Oil out of the can is not three micron clean. Yeah, so guess what happens? Yeah, you get, you get lots of bypasses, and basically, I think the maintenance action was reset the bypass button, but you had to pull the filter housing to do that. So the filter housing gets pulled quite a lot. Normal maintenance action. So do the mechanics think that this is unusual? Based on their experience with other aircraft and all of this sort of stuff, they don't think it's anything out of the ordinary. Um, so is it going to get reported as a service difficulty? No. Do the Sikorsky engineers know that this filter is being pulled as often as it is? Probably not. No one's reporting it as a service difficulty. So it's a left hand versus right hand situation. Maintenance personnel didn't know the filter shouldn't need this maintenance. And by the way, they now pre-filter the oil 
before they put it in the transmission. I think they've got a filter that takes it down to one micron clean so it's really clean and so they don't have any bypass filters popping. Sikorsky engineers didn't know the filter was being removed so frequently. There's a little question about that now in my mind, but that's another thing. So at least 10 times on that particular airframe that that filter had been off, that they never expected it to be changed. It gets worse. There had been two incidents of oil filters coming off and losing all the oil. Both cases, the aircraft landed safely, okay? There was no, didn't seem to be any particular concern within the continuing airworthiness sections of any of the operators of the S-92 at the government authority level that this was a problem. Why not? They did not know that this assumption that the transmission oil filter could fail was in the certification basis. There was nothing to say, hey, transmission oil filter fails, serious problem. None of that. So it's not, not unreasonable that the government authority didn't do anything when they knew of these two particular cases. So continuing airworthiness didn't know that the, it was a critical item and that it was used for the justification of no 30-minute run-dry capability because, as Sikorsky had correctly demonstrated, there was no way to have all the oil get out of the transmission except for this. They'd worked out all of the other things to say, start to lose oil through the oil cooling system, we shut it off. We've got, it, we've got that covered. But this wasn't covered because it had never been a problem before. So, problem, we got a real problem matching operational experience with certification assumptions all over the world. We need a way to match that certification analysis with real world experience. Um, it's all data, folks. There's got to be a way to put this together in a good database to say, here's the assumptions we made, here's all of the things we think we should, that should fail and the rates they should fail, and then get the operators to come back and report what's going on. The beginning of this lecture, I started with, this is the next steps in, in, in safety for helicopters. This step is not going to be an easy or quick step to be made, but it should be made. Someone should start pushing this to say this is the sort of thing we need to make sure that we close this loop on the continuum of safety in, in certification. Um, we also need a lot more things to be reported. This is going to mean things like everybody that has to change oil filters or do anything with oil filters on all helicopters as an example, is going to have to start reporting that so that people will know and understand at the manufacturer's end and hopefully also at the government end what's going on. Um, at the risk of upsetting some manufacturers here, in a perfect world, they would be doing that. In a perfect world. But in a perfect world, we probably wouldn't need helicopters either. So. We have a, we have a uh, several part process to this. Uh, in a perfect world, we wouldn't need a government certification agency to make sure that the aircraft that are produced meet the requirements. But we're not in a perfect world. So not only should the, the manufacturers be, be working on this, but so should the authorities, the civil authorities, in order to make sure that we capture all of this. So, for example, all engine failures should be, caught, should be caught. As I said, we do have service difficulties re reports, but not all manufacturers or countries are involved. Okay? We need a way to monitor that. As I said, it's all data. Someone could make a program to monitor it. Um, I'd like to say that would be the end of all of our problems. But I'm sure, as you know from looking at accidents, 
What percentage do we think are caused by technical error, technical or, or malfunctions of equipment? Five? Uh, uh, probably 20 percent. Maybe you could, you could go back there. But a huge percentage are caused by human error. And we have no way to capture all of those in a centralized location. Okay? Some countries do better at it than others, but not everyone does it. I was visiting a country. The uh, pilots there told me about a particular handling problem in a helicopter, which they reported to their authorities, who then reported it to the manufacturer, and the response was, we've never seen that. We don't believe you go away. And it wasn't until three years later when another country's uh, operator had the same problem with the helicopter that they finally paid attention. So we've got no way to, to uh, track the technical ones, and we even have even less of a way to track the human errors that, that come up. So what do we need here? Who wants to stand up and say, I screwed up? How many here are willing to do that if you're a pilot and you did something wrong? Hmm? How many of you would worry for your job if you did that? I think it's quite natural that not many people are going to stand up and say, hey, I screwed up, unless you've got a really good environment. So, because it has career-ending implications. <laughs> when I was in the Canadian Air Force, we had flight safety incident uh, stuff that we had to report. The maintenance guys had to report any maintenance things that happened. Well, for them, it was actually much worse than for the pilots because there was career action taken against some of the people who reported stuff. So you can imagine people really didn't want to report things. In those days, long before we were worried about uh, um, privacy and that sort of thing, every month or so, the Air Force would publish the list of who got promoted and who was going to where. And they would include the social, insu social insurance number, social security number for the US in there. I mean, that was, how naive were we in those days? So guess what? Guess whose social insurance number ended up on most of the maintenance incident forms? Any idea? Chief of the Defense Staff. I started to say, what? He doesn't even work on airplanes. But that was the way these people used to protect themselves. So we need a way to capture those human error problems. NASA has the ASRS, Aviation Safety Reporting System. Any of you ever looked at it? What were you trying to find, Mike? Oh, okay, yeah. Why do you want to submit an ASRS most of the time? Yeah, you report if it, in, in the United States, if you've had something where you violated airspace inadvertently, for example, if you submit an ASRS, that's your get out of jail free card. The FAA won't come after you. So when you look through there, there's very few helicopter incidents in there, simply because we don't seem to have a problem with violating airspace. But there's other, other incidences in there that are quite interesting. What they do is they de-identify the event. So you could go back and do a search. You can't ever say, oh, this, this, that must have happened here. So the people who submit it are protected. We need something similar. The question is, who is going to do it? Where is that going to reside? OK? I think that's a challenge to the International Helicopter Safety Team. We need a system like that set up, run by someone that we can report all of this stuff to, because as we know, for every accident, we've got 10 incidents or more, but we've got no way of capturing that and disseminating it to the rest of the world. 
Another problem for helicopters on SMS um, is data. SMS is a data-driven system, okay? Our problem is, as we've seen from service difficulty reports and human things, is we have very little data to go on. Um, we probably have 1% of the data that the fixed-wing airline world has. Okay, I heard the, the number earlier this morning, 8 million flight hours in commercial helicopters around the world last year. Any idea how much uh, the fixed-wing airline world generates? Well, I did a quick look this morning. Um, one large airline does 880 departures from Atlanta every day. They've got 700 aircraft. They're going to fly at least 2,000 hours per aircraft per year, or not, er not earning their money. So that's 1,400, or sorry, 1, 400,000 hours in one airline alone. I did a quick look at the top 10, I think. They had eight, uh, it was some huge number, way beyond what we have. If you look at the 737 fleet, there's 10,000 737s produced. Again, flying 2,000 hours a year in those 737s, that quickly eclipses anything that we've got. So we don't have enough data, sadly, to really make SMS work effectively across the whole helicopter fleet. We have inconsistent analysis uh, and a lack of critical appraisal of the condition of the system. The other one we use, and this will lead into the next part, is linear analysis to determine a cause-effect thing. If any, was any, were any of you in here for the previous lecture? Fernando did a wonderful job leading into this, and we didn't talk before. Um, what's linear analysis? It's a cause-effect thing. It works for simple mechanical systems, okay? Gear fails, this happens. Are we in a simple, linear world? No. We throw people into this whole thing. And that gives us some very complex interrelated systems. So a linear analysis is going to look something like this. This is a, uh, an approach incident where air traffic's, there's the air traffic actors over here, and there's the timeline of what goes on, and you can say that's where the problem was in a linear, simple system. You'll see that's not, we'll come back to this later, that's not the real world, okay? Um, so how did we get there? Well, we got 2,500 years of logic and experience based on that. Most of the stuff we've used up to now has been real simple mechanical systems. I mean, when you think about it, computers only came into aircraft when? 25 years ago? When we really started to get involved with using computers, and systems have become increasingly more complex since then. Um, so we have that sort of problem of that's the way we've always done it, so we think that's the way we should always do it. Not quite right. And uh, some interesting concepts here, to, if you're ever trying to worry about whether your information is uh, reliable or valid, uh, you need to think about this. If you're trying to hit the target, the top left one is unreliable and invalid, okay? Unreliable but valid on the, on the right-hand side, because you've got a good scattering around and somewhere you're, you're getting close to the target. Reliable on the bottom left, they're all in the same place, so it all looks right, but it's not valid. And if it's hitting the target, and it's nicely grouped, then you've got valid and reliable data. So, today's lesson in Zen, okay? This is one of these things that took a while for me to try and understand. The very things that make us successful are the things that are going to cause us to fail. Does that surprise anyone? What do I mean by that? All right. 
We, break, we all break rules all the time. Again, this morning you heard something about 200 rules had to be broken before there was even a significant issue. How many of you can drive anywhere and absolutely always obey every traffic rule? I don't see any hands. Okay, so what rules did you break? Do you know the rules that you broke? At the end of the, at the, end of the drive, could you sit down and say, I, I broke this rule, and this rule, and this rule? So we don't, we're often not even aware of the rules that we're breaking, right? So, but that's how we make things work. I mean, you drove from A to B, did you have an accident? No. Well, you didn't quite stop at the stop signs, but there was nobody coming. Uh, you certainly didn't obey the speed limit, but I mean, you were going with the flow of traffic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But eventually, eventually, one of those will catch you, or something like that will catch you. How many of you have had a traffic accident? Yeah, all right. What caused the traffic accident? The other driver. The other driver. Okay, right. <laughs> now the other driver broke at least one rule, didn't they? Okay, but they'd probably been doing that for quite a while. So um, that's how we make it work. Same thing in the aviation world. No one can complete a flight without breaking at least one rule or SOP. I don't know anybody that could. Okay. In the helicopter world, we have it good and bad, okay? One of the things I love about flying helicopters is not all the rules have been written, okay? Compare, compare the fixed wing world where they have to take off and land on runways and helicopter flying where sometimes when you take off, you're not sure where you're gonna land, okay? So that flexibility is great, it's wonderful. For people who like it, it's good. How many of you have ever had someone come into the helicopter world and leave because they couldn't handle the flexibility required? Right, okay. But for those who love the flexibility, it's absolutely great. But that's exactly the thing that gets us in trouble because we're able to do so many things without reference to rules. The problem is, at some point, that flexibility, we go too far, okay? This is uh, typical signal uh, information from a whole bunch of different sensors. Um, I'd like to uh, have you believe that's also what people are like. How many of you feel 100% today, right now, as you sit here? thought somebody would put their hand up. How many are running at uh, 80%? 30%. How many of you are gonna fall asleep in the next few minutes, okay? So we have this same sort of category. We, we're up and down all over the place. Now the problem is, when you put that together with all of the things that happen in flying, we have a real problem. And this is what Peter, uh, Peter was gonna talk about. Um, you know, what happens when all the lows line up? Wow, we have a, we, that's when we have a problem. And <clears throat> the subject Peter was gonna cover is FRAM, Functional Resonance Analysis Method. It's um, very well researched in the academic world. It hasn't hit the safety world yet because it's a new way of looking at things and doing things. Uh, it was developed by Eric Hallnagel back in 2004, he's just published a book called The Functional Resonance Analysis Method. I don't have copies of it. And basically, performance variability varies dynamically, both internally and externally. And when you throw that together with a complex system, which is what we are and have, we have a problem. It models how the components of a system can resonate and interact with each other and 
sometimes cause a system to lose balance, leading to accidents. So it addresses how a system really works, not how it's supposed to work, okay? <laughs>